I want to begin with a quote found in the book Desire of Ages. Has anybody here ever read the book Desire of Ages? Okay, Marianne. Very good. All right, very good. For those who have not, never read the book Desire of Ages, either here or at home, then I highly encourage it. It has been noted, not only by Seventh-day Adventists, but by non-Seventh-day Adventists, this is the greatest book on the life of Jesus ever written. And in this book, she says this in page 83. It would be well for us, now who's us? To spend a thoughtful hour each day in contemplation of the life of Christ. Do you think that's good counsel? Yes. Because there is a principle that goes, by beholding, you become changed. Okay? She continues. Look at this. We should take it point by point and let the imagination grasp each scene. And then I'm going to focus right here, especially the what? Yeah. We are to look at the life of Christ and contemplate that, but she then says, especially the closing scenes. There is something about the closing scenes of the life of Jesus that is powerful. She continues to say, as we thus dwell upon His great sacrifice for us, our confidence in Him will be more constant, our love will be quickened, and we shall be more deeply imbued with His Spirit. If, if we would be saved at last, we must learn the lesson of penitence and humiliation at the foot of the cross. In that light, I invite you to turn to the book of Matthew chapter 27. Let us do this. Let us look at the closing scenes of the life of Jesus. Matthew 27. Matthew chapter 27. You can say amen when you get there. So let's be awake and attentive. Let's grasp the closing scenes of the life of Jesus. So, as you turn to Matthew 27, let's get the context. Christ has just been arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's been betrayed by one of His disciples. What was His name? Judas. And Judas betrays Jesus. He is then taken where? Where is Christ taken after the Garden of Gethsemane? To the Sanhedrin. The leaders are having a council now, right? He comes, many people are there, and this council is by night. Is that following the, the Jewish traditional laws to have a council to condemn at night? No, they are, they are even breaking their own traditional Jewish laws to condemn Jesus here. Christ is arrested on Thursday night. You with me? He is at the council here all night. All what? All night. We're in chapter 27 now. Look at verse 1 and 2. What's the first three words? When the morning came, what is that telling us? That again, that Christ has been there in the Sanhedrin for all, all night. The morning has come now. Are you with me? Continues. All the chief priests and the elders of the people plotted against Jesus to do what? To put Him to death, to kill Him. And when they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to who? To Pontius Pilate, the governor. Okay? We then see that Judas hangs himself uh, out of guilt, what he has done. Christ faces Pilate, and we're now in verse 11. I'm sorry, verse 15. Now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to releasing the multitude, one prisoner whom they wished. And at that time, they had a notorious prisoner called who? Barabbas. We're going to come back to him in a minute. But in Matthew, he's referred to as what kind of a prisoner? Notorious. 
Verse 17, therefore, when they had gathered together Pilate to them, whom do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called the Christ? For he knew that they had handed him over because of envy. Let's stop there. Now, the, the word, the name Barabbas means son of the father. And Origen, who is a very early scholar, theologian, says that really this man's name was Jesus Barabbas. We have two Jesuses up there, one who was Barabbas and the other one who was referred to as the Christ. Now, here's the thing. Barabbas was a notorious, notorious prisoner. Now, look at the screen here. In the book of Mark, it gives us more information on who this Barabbas is. It says, and there was one named Barabbas who was chained with his fellow rebels. They had committed murder in rebellion. Barabbas and his fellow rebels, they murdered and rebelled. Who did they rebel against who? The Rome. So here we have a man who is a notorious prisoner, a murderer, and rebellious. It then says in the book of John, and they all cried again, saying, not this man, but Barabbas. Now, Barabbas was a robber. Barabbas was the kind of Messiah they were wanting. Barabbas was the kind of Messiah or leader that would cry or rebel against the government of Rome, this is the Messiah they wanted. This was Jesus Barabbas, and then you had Jesus the Christ, and they were both presented there, and the Bible says that Pilate asked them, who do you want us to deliver to you? This notorious prisoner who is a murderer and rebellious against Rome and a robber, or Christ, Christ, who has healed the multitudes, Christ, who has spoke encouragement to the discouraged, Christ, who had raised the dead to life, Christ, who had fed the 5,000 and the 4,000, Christ, who had healed the blind and the lame. Who do you want? Barabbas. Now, the Bible says that he here, was with his fellow rebels. Was Jesus crucified alone? No. These rebels were the ones that were crucified with Jesus. But who did Jesus take the place of? Barabbas. Jesus takes the place of the most notorious sinner. Isn't that interesting? That Jesus takes the place of Barabbas, this notorious sinner. Now go to verse 21 and look at this tragedy here that we also see. Not only are the people crying for Barabbas to be released over Jesus, the governor answered and said to them, which of the two do you want me to release to you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, what then shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ, the, who is the, the anointed one, Christ? They all said to him, let him be crucified. Then the governor said, why? What evil has he done? But they cried out all the more, saying, let him be crucified. And when Pilate saw that he could not prevail at all, but rather that a tumult was rising, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. You see to it. And all the people answered and said, This blood be on us and our children. Then he released Barabbas to them. And when they had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Now let me bring something out to you as we are focusing and dissecting the final moments of the life of Jesus. Number one, Jesus takes the place of Barabbas, a most notorious criminal, and is crucified in his stead. And then the people, not just the Pharisees, not just the Sadducees, not just the, the leaders, the people, the same people that he healed and fed and raised, all, the same people that he loved and embraced, the same people that, he, that he, he cared for said, crucify this man. Interesting that the same people that once wanted to follow him are the same people that wanted to kill him. 
Now listen carefully, and what this is telling me is that not one person, not one person came to the defense of Jesus. Not one person came to the defense of Jesus, the man who healed them, had compassion on them, and did all those things. Not one person said, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Let, let's hold up. Not one person came to the defense of Jesus. Not one. Not even one disciple of Jesus. And the Bible says that as he's there alone, they scourged him. Now, listen carefully. Scourging or flogging was something done to those who had rebelled against Rome. Now, there were laws, not, not women and or Roman citizens could be flogged or crucified. This was for the most grievous. But I want to tell you something, that there were three, three types of floggings, three degrees of floggings. How many degrees? Three. Listen carefully. There was one degree in the first century. Uh, there was three degrees of flogging or scourging during the first century, and there are three different words for the degrees. Fustigatio was this, for minor offenses, usually accompanied with a stern warning. So the first degree here was done it, for minor offenses. It wasn't as grievous, okay? It would still hurt, don't get me wrong, but that was the one degree. Then there was another degree, and this was called flagellatio, fairly brutal, administered to criminals whose infractions were more serious. And then the third degree, verberatio, brutal, inhumane in its scope, frequently fatal, usually administered along with other punishments like crucifixion. If the convinced, convicted sur survived the flogging, there, the verb, verberatio, the third degree of, 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 of scourging, only came after a death sentence was handed down. It was a way of weakening the condemned. Does that make sense what I'm saying here? Three degrees. One was sort of depending on what the council had chosen, uh, a minor offenses, and then there was a second degree if the offenses were more grievous. But if you were condemned to death and to crucify, then you got the third one, the most brutal of all scourgings. You with me? Now, why is that significant? Because if you study, if you study significantly all the Gospels and some of the Greek there, we're going to see, you would see there, that Christ was actually flogged twice. How many times? Twice. Again, we don't have time to look at all the Gospels to see that. But again, if you follow the sequence of the Gospel writers... And understand the three degrees, Christ was actually flogged twice, and the spirit of prophecy confirms that he was. But, just stay with me. What we can assume is, is that there were two floggings, a light one to give as a way to appease the Jews, and a far more brutal one preparing Christ for the crucifixion. You see, what you learn is, is that Pilate was doing what he can to free him in regards to trying to appeal to the crowd. And what he did is, is he got Christ flogged, the first degree, brought him back out and said, okay, okay, see, I flogged him, hoping that they would sort of have sympathy on that and free him. So Christ was sort of flogged in the first degree to sort of appease the Jews to, okay, you know, that might be enough, free him. But the Jews said, no, 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 that's not enough. We want him to be crucified. Are you with me so far? And then he was brought back after his sentence and got the third degree, which was the most brutal one. You with me? In Desire of Ages, page 744, arriving at the place of execution, the prisoners were bound to the instruments of torture. The two thieves wrestled in the hands of those who placed them on the cross. That's not the one. It's not in here. Okay. I'll read it here from my notes. It's on page 741. You listening? From insult to renewed insult, from mockery to mockery, twice 
tortured by the scourge, she says. How many times? Okay. Again, we can see that from the Bible, the first degree to appease the Jews, and then the more brutal, devastating one when he was sentenced to be crucified. She continues, all that night there had been scene after scene of a character to try the soul of man to the uttermost. Christ had not failed. He had spoken no word, but, the te but that tended to glorify God. All through the disgraceful fray fray farce of a trial, he had borne himself with firmness and dignity. But when after the second scourging, the cross was laid upon him. You guys with me? Christ takes the place of Barabbas. And then... Not one person comes to the defense of Jesus who has loved them and cared for them. And then he scorched twice. One, to appease the Jews, first degree, when he sentenced, then he got the most brutal of ones there. And what would happen is, is that they would, they, would strip, they would strip the prisoner of all his clothes. They would hang him with his hands up above his, uh, they would... Um, not hang him, but he would be placed there with his hands above his head, and they would be tied, and they would then take this, this, uh, this whip type of, uh, of instrument, and they would begin to lash at an angle, starting up from top all the way down to the, to the, to the ankles, and then right back up. Scourging. And after this, what happens? We're in verse 27. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole garrison around him, and they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. Now, don't miss that, because if you put clothes, if you put clothes back over the wounds of the scourging, and then you rip that garment back out, friends, it's not a pretty sight. We're told that if we begin to grasp the final scenes of the life of Jesus, there is something there that will begin to work in our hearts. But I'm going to show you here. I'm just touching on the outward, but we're going to get to the real issue of what really Christ was going through in the inward heart. Just stay with me. You have to, uh, uh, quote unquote, appreciate the outward pain so you can really understand the true hurt Christ was going through in his heart. Just stay with me. Let's keep reading what else happened to Jesus here. Verse 29, and when they had twisted a, co a crown of thorns, they put it on his head. When I was in Israel last year, I went to Israel at this very time. At this very time last year, I was in Israel. And as we were touring around Israel, they brought into the bus a, 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 a thorn bush that most likely was used to put on the, to be weeded together and put on the, on the, on the head of Jesus. And I tell you not, when, when they gave me that, 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 that bush, it was like a long, a long thread that had all these, all these, you know, spikes coming through it. And those spikes were like this long and sharp as a knife. And you, you look at this thing here and you just imagine how they weeded that together and they put it on the head of Jesus and then they just sort of rammed it down there in his head and it continues. And they put it on his head and a reed on his right hand and they bowed the knee before him and mocking him saying, oh hail king of the Jews. And they spat on him. This is the creator of the universe. Jesus was the main agent of creation and his own creation is spitting in his face. You and I can't comprehend the love that God has. You can't, we can't comprehend. Anybody here likes to be spit on? They spat at him and took the reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they took the robe off him, put his own clothes on him, and led him away to be what? To be crucified. Crucifixion, not invented by the Romans, invented by the Persians, but yet the Romans, what's the word? 
perfected the art of crucifixion. It was a very slow and torturous thing. Okay? Desire of Ages says, arriving at the place of execution, the prisoners were bound to the instruments of torture. Two thieves wrestled in the hands of those who placed them on the cross, but Jesus made no what? Resistance. Isn't that incredible? What is that telling us? That Christ is going willingly. Can you say amen? The other two trying to escape, Christ makes no resistance. The Savior made no murmur of complaint. His face remained calm and serene, but great drops of sweat stooped upon his brow. And what she quotes next is this. She quotes the verse that says, Lord, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Cicero, he was a Roman politician and lawyer. Cicero was one of the leading political figures of the era of Julius Caesar, Pompey, Mark Antony, and Octavian. Look what he says. He says he called crucifixion the extreme and ultimate punishment of slaves and the cruelest and most disgusting penalty. Josephus, a Jewish historian, says crucifixion the most pitiable of deaths. Crucifixion was the most horrible of deaths. Listen carefully and listen good. You see what they would do. You probably understand this, is that they would bring you there and then they would uh, uh, get you on that cross and then they would strike nails right, not in the hand, but up here where the palm area, because here, if they do it here, the bone is able to sustain. If you do it here in the hand, it's going to rip through. Are you understanding? So really, it's here. And then they, they, they pierce it over here, and then they hang there. Now listen carefully, and they're up there completely naked. It's the most humiliating and torturous event, and they would line up the crucify, the cruci- the, those who were crucified there outside the city where one of the main roads were that when people came into the city, they would walk and see these poor souls crucified up there, naked and humiliated. And what that would say was this, don't mess with Rome. That when you came into the city, it would let you know, don't mess with Rome. And the only way to breathe was to lift, lift yourself up, take a breath, and then you would sort of stump back down. That's why when they, they, they broke the legs of the two thieves, because if they break their legs, they can't raise themselves up to breathe, and they suffocate. Are you with me? So here is the king of the universe up there, crucified for the world. But I'm about to show you that though Christ suffered greatly outwardly, that wasn't his real battle. Stay with me. The Bible tells us that something very unusual happened on the cross. Go to Matthew 27. And we're in verse 45. Now take a look at this. Something unusual happened here. Now it's time to wake up. Something unusual happens here on the cross. Are you in verse 45 of Matthew 27? The Bible says, Now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour there was darkness over all the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? And now look at verse 50. And Jesus cried out again in a loud voice, and he yielded up his spirit. The word spirit there means breath. He stopped breathing. That means he what? Died. Now let's think. And you're going to say, okay, well, what's so unusual there? Well, Look at verse 45 and, uh, and 6 again. It says that from the sixth hour 
until the ninth hour there was darkness over all the land. Now, that is unusual, but that's not the unusual thing that I'm going to bring up. There was something else unusual happened there. Now, listen carefully. Stay with me. The Bible says here, it's on the screen, it was the third hour and they crucified him. That's what Mark tells us. Now, let's think and do the math. The third hour is nine in the morning, okay? Christ was crucified at 9 a.m., their time. It then says that in the sixth hour, darkness came over the land. So, he then died in the ninth hour, okay? So, 9 a.m. is the third hour. Three hours later, which is the sixth hour, takes us to what time? Noon. And then he dies in the ninth hour, which is three hours later. What does that take us to? Three. So Christ was crucified at nine in the morning, and he died at three in the afternoon. Are you with me? So for you math scholars out there, how many hours was Christ on the cross? Six hours. Okay? Now, the Bible says that at noon it became dark, until he died. Now, that is unusual, but here's the thing. That's not the unusual thing I want to bring up. Something else is unusual about Christ only lasting six hours. Now, to you and I, six hours is a long time to be on a cross, and maybe to many people as well, but I'm going to show you now that six, that most, most who were crucified lasted, if not throughout the night, a day and sometimes even two days. It was a very slow and torturous death. And I'm going to show you that even Pilate was astonished Christ only lasted six hours. Now, this is Origen. He lived a long time ago. He was a Christian theologian, and look what he says. He lived in the time of when crucifixion was still what? Mentions that the majority of victims lived through the night and through the next day. Okay? He says that most who were crucified lived longer. They they, they wouldn't just like they put on and they died. Six hours is a very short time to last on the cross. And let me say something. Christ was no weakling. Christ was a carpenter, and he did not have DeWalt and or Milwaukee in those days. When you wanted to make a table, you used your hands and muscles. Amen. And you're going to say, oh, well, well, he was scorched twice. You know, one very lightly and the other one, and the other one more. But listen carefully. There, were, there had been other people in the world that have suffered more physically than Christ. Believe it. Christ is not the only one ever to be scorched and or crucified. There have been people in this world who have suffered beyond comprehension more than what Christ did physically. Look at this, Desire of Ages, page 83. With many... The story of the condescension, humiliation, and sacrifice of our divine Lord awakens no deeper interest than does the history of the death of the martyrs of Jesus. Look at this. Many have suffered death by slow tortures. Christ wasn't the only one. I'm going to get to my point here. I'm trying to show you that Christ lasting only six hours is unusual. Something else is happening. Because others have suffered if not more. Physically. Are you with me? Physically. Many have suffered death by slow tortures. Others have suffered death by crucifixion. In what does the death of God's dear Son differ from these? If the sufferings of Christ consisted in physical pain alone, then His death was no more painful than that of some of the martyrs. Look at this. But bodily pain was but a small part of the agony of God's dear Son. What is she saying here?
Go to Mark 15, take a look. Jesus only lasting six hours on the cross was very unusual. And even Pilate was surprised. Mark 15, take a look. Mark 15, verses 43 through 45. Outer pain, though great, was not the reason Jesus lasted only six hours on the cross. I'm going to say that again. The outer pain, though it was great, was not the reason Christ only lasted six hours. We're in Mark chapter 15, verses 43 and 45. Say amen if you're there. The Bible says, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent council member who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, coming and taking uh, courage, went to Pilate and asked for who? For the body of Jesus. Look at verse 44. Look at it carefully. Pilate, what's the word? Marveled that he was already dead. And summoning the centurions, he asked him if he had been dead for some time. Look at this. He comes and says, Christ is dead already. Now now think, this is a man who had seen hundreds of scourgings and hundreds of crucifixions. And he says, even even after witnessing what Christ went through, he was like, he's dead already? What is he saying? This is unusual for him to die so soon, even after all the pain outwardly he was going through, because others have suffered as much, if not more, in the outer pain. Are you with me? So why So why did Jesus die so soon? Let's take a look. Did you know that the suffering of Jesus happened well before the scourging? The Bible says in the book of Matthew 26, Then he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. Christ was already feeling the most ultimate pain, not in the outward parts, but in his inner heart. Are you with me? He was already starting to suffer in the garden well before he got even to the scourgings. Are you understanding? He was already starting to die in a sense. And being in agony, Luke 22 verse 44, and being in agony, he prayed earnestly. Then his sweat became like great drops of what? Blood falling down to the ground. Luke was a physician. That's why he's the only one that brings this out. You see, this was the bursting of capillaries here in the head. He was in so much stress at this moment that literally they began to burst and he begins to sweat drops of blood. This is a, this is a real occurrence here for those who are so under stress, so under affliction that the capillaries begin to burst. Already, again, before the, the scourgings and the cross, things were happening. Are you understanding? He was already starting to, to suffer. Now, let's get even deeper. Let's get even deeper. Go to the book of John 19. Here we go. Let's get deeper into this. What really killed Jesus? Why did he only last six hours? This is unusual, Pilate said. I, he marveled. How could he only last only six hours? How is this possible? Because many lasted much longer. Who, who, who was still alive on the cross when Christ died? Two others. The others, don't, don't miss it, if the others were crucified, they were scourged too. Because it was a practice that if you were crucified, you would get the third degree of scourging. Are you understanding? We're in John, what did I say? John 19, beginning in verse 28. Here we go. Why did Christ only last six hours on the cross? We see that his pain already began to come, to come forth in the Garden of Gethsemane. We're in John chapter 19, beginning in verse 28. Here we go. Are we there? After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the Scriptures might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. And a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there, and they filled a sponge with sour wine and put it on hyssop and put it to his mouth. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. Again, the word there means breath. He died. Therefore, 
because it was preparation day, that the bodies should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken, that they might not uh, might be taken away. Again, why did I say that their legs had to be broken if they were still alive? Yeah, because they couldn't lift themselves up, so they couldn't, then they would suffocate, right? Okay, keep going. Now we're in verse 32. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Now verse 34 is key. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and immediately something came out. And why would the Bible want to mention this? What came out of the side of Jesus? Blood and water. What this is telling us is that Christ literally, literally, Christ's heart literally burst. Do you know that around the heart there is a a little, what's it called? Pericardium, sac, okay? Yes, pericardium sac. So the Bible is saying, why would it mention this? Because when he pierced them up, blood and water came. What the Bible is saying is that his heart literally burst. Go to Psalm 22. Look what it says here. This is a messianic prophecy, Psalm chapter 22. Psalm 22. We're almost finishing up here. Psalm 22. This is a messianic prophecy. Look what it says. Let me show you that the Bible had predicted this was going to happen. And then we'll see why did his heart burst. Psalm 22, beginning in verse 15. Psalm 22, beginning in verse 15. Say amen if you're there. Now, let me prove to you in the context here that this is a messianic prophecy. What does a messianic prophecy mean? Yeah, a prophecy that would describe what the Messiah would go through when he came. Look at verse 15. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue clings to my jaws. You have brought me to the, to the dust of death, for dogs have surrounded me, and congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They what? Ah, oh, they pierced my hands and my feet. Is this a messianic prophecy, yes or no? Yes, we keep reading. What verse are we on? 17, I count all my bones. They took, they look and stare at me. Look at this. They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. This is describing what happened at the death of Jesus. Yes or no? Is the context here a messianic prophecy? Yes or no? Look at verse 14. Look at verse 14. It says this. I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. What does it say? My heart is like wax. It has melted within me. Why did Jesus only last six hours? Because his heart burst. And you're going to say, oh, that's because he was suffering so much of the physical pain. Well, why are the other two still living? I'm going to show you he died or his heart burst because of the weight of sin. Look at the screen. Another messianic prophecy. What's the first word here? Reproach has what? has broken my heart, and all I am full of heaviness. I looked for someone to take pity, but there was none, and for comforters, but I found none. He said, reproach has done what? Broken my heart. What's reproach? We let the Bible interpret itself. Look at the book of Proverbs 14.34. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to my people. So when the Bible says that reproach broke his heart, What's reproach? It was sin. Go to Isaiah 53. Take a look. 
Christ could only last six hours because our sins literally ruptured the Son of God. Isaiah, look at 53 quickly. Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53. Say amen when you get there. Verse 4. Isaiah 53, verse 4, the Bible says. Isaiah. Some are still flipping. It's all right. Isaiah. When all to the... Christ's suffering. The outward suffering of Jesus was just a little compared to the inner struggle he was going through. The true pain of God was in his heart. Why did Christ only last six hours? Because the, the sin of the world was on him and his heart literally burst, burst because of the sin of the world. Are you with me? His true pain was on the inside. Isaiah 53. Look at verse 4. It says this. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. Verse 6. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquities of us all. Amen. Look at verse 12. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great, and he will divide upon the spoil the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death. And he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many and made trans inter intercession for the transgressors. The reality is that Christ literally could only last six hours because his heart burst, literally. Blood and water came flowing out. Why? Because the sin of the world, your sins and mine, broke his heart, literally. That's how much God loves you. Take a look at this. In the book, Desire of Ages, upon Christ as our substitute and surety was laid the iniquity of us all. She's referring, she's referring to here, as we just read, Isaiah 53. He was counted a transgressor that he might redeem us from the condemnation of the law. The guilt of every descendant of Adam was pre pressing upon his what? Who here is a descendant of Adam? The wrath of God against sin, the terrible manifestation of his displeasure because of iniquity, filled the soul of his son with consternation. Not only was he feeling the sins of the world from Adam all the way to our day, you and me, and even beyond our day, was laid upon him, and then the separation of the Father, his heart just couldn't, and it literally just burst, and Christ could only last six hours. Now, you might not like what I'm going to say, but I'm going to say it. That's why I don't like the movie, The Passion of the Christ. Because all they do is focus on the outward pain, and they say nothing about what the true pain was, his heart. Many have suffered physically. We, we, we believe that Peter was crucified upside down. It's bad enough to be crucified on your feet. What about your head down? Others have been tortured, scourged, and all, as I did my research about the death of Jesus, almost every article, just like the movies, only focus on the outward, outward thing. But the reality is the outward pain was nothing. The true issue was the sin of the world on his heart. She continues, all his life Christ had been publishing to a fallen world the good news of the Father's mercy and pardoning love. Salvation uh, of chief sinners was his theme, but now the terrible weight of guilt he bears, he cannot see the Father's reconciling face. The withdrawal of the divine countenance from the Savior in his hour of supreme anguish pierced his what? His heart with a sorrow that can never be fully understood by man. Continues. So great was his agony, look at this, that his physical pain was hardly felt. 
wh wh what do people usually focus on when they come to the death of Jesus? His what? His outward. But we're told here, and of course what we're seeing, is that the outward physical pain was hardly felt. That, that really wasn't the issue. He was agonizing more where? In his heart. That's where the true pain was. But it was not the spear thrust, it was not the pain of the cross that caused the death of Jesus. I'm going to say that. But it was not the spear thrust, it was not the pain on the cross that caused the death of Jesus. That cry uttered with a loud voice, at the moment of death, the stream of blood and water that flowed from his side declared that he died of a what? What really killed Jesus? The heart. That he died of a broken heart. His heart was broken by mental anguish. He was slain by the sin of the world. One more. God so deeply, so passionately, so selflessly loves each of us that he was willing to save us at any cost to himself. And the cost was great. As we focus on the final hours of Jesus, we see, yes, that he suffered greatly physically, absolutely. But that's not where our focus should be. Others have been tortured. When it comes to the death of Jesus, our focus should not be how much he suffered physically, but how much he suffered inwardly. Does that make sense? That's where we truly see the love of God. Yes, it's something to suffer physically. I'm not trying to diminish that much, but I want to let, put the focus where the focus needs to be. He died of a broken heart, literally, because of your sins and my sins. Broke his heart. The physical pain was hardly felt by Christ compared to the inner anguish he was facing. The reality is, is that mercy and justice was seen at the cross. Amen. Mercy and justice was seen at the cross. 1 Thessalonians 5, For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another, just as you also are doing. Galatians, grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. And God's people said, Amen. One more, 1 Peter 2, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, who, by whose stripes you were healed. The reality is, friends, when we take time to look at the life of Jesus, especially the closing scenes. We see a God who literally gave up everything, took the place of Barabbas. Not one person came to his defense, scorched twice, different degrees, crucified, humiliated, but all that outward pain was but a percentage of the true agony he was facing, the sins of the world pressing upon him, and his heart literally couldn't take any more, and it literally burst because of the sins of the world, hence blood, blood and water came out. Literally, literally, God gave his heart for you and me. Did you hear what I said? Literally, literally, God gave his heart for you and me. 
And we've become so calloused, so calloused to the death of Jesus, so calloused to sin, that we study what Christ went through and it doesn't even affect us. But I pray that it can affect us. So listen carefully. If God literally gave us his heart, I think he's asking in return that we give him our hearts. Isn't that a rightful transition or a tra transaction there? He literally gave us his heart, and now he's appealing to us to literally give him his heart. Lord, your heart, my heart is yours. It's yours. That's what God wants. God doesn't need your money. It's his money, really. He doesn't want your cars, doesn't want your house, doesn't want... What he wants is your heart. That's what he wants. That's what he desires. And that's what he gave for us. So who here today will say, Lord, I'm going to give you my heart today. You're going to say, oh, I've done that already, but you're going to do it afresh today. Afresh. Lord, I want to give you my heart. Anybody here? Yes, yeah, stand. If that's you, stand, stand. You're making a commitment today to say, Lord, I'm going to give God my heart. Anybody here desire that? Make that commitment today. Praise the Lord. You're making this commitment to God himself. Not to me. Well, I'm going to stand up because the pastor's watching. We'll sit down. I don't care. It's about you and God. Lord, I'm giving you my heart today. Today, I give you everything, my heart. God bless you. God bless you. Did this message make sense today? Why did Christ last 26 hours? Because he gave us his heart, absolutely.